do we need a European Parliament? What does it do for Scotland? How much do people really know about it? The European Parliament. I don't know anything about it. I haven't a clue, I haven't heard anything about it. I'd like to know what can be done in the European Parliament. A more detailed analysis of the powers of the Parliament would be quite useful, yes. I really don't know anything about it, if it's Brussels. I think Scots have their share of doubts. Uh, about the European ideal, but I think um, we have a, a duty to uh, explain how it actually works and how it could actually work better for us uh, if we were connected properly and participating properly. And a lot of that is to do with the need for Europe, and I think people are getting more sensitive to this. Uh, the, the European institutions out here must value ever more strongly local knowledge, not just the local knowledge of people in Scotland, the local knowledge of people in every community in Europe, because it's local knowledge that's real. It has to connect on to the, the big ideas, the directives and this and that, but if they don't connect to that, it won't work. But why have a European Parliament in the first place? In 1946, just decades ago, Europe was in ruins at the end of a second European war a war which had come to involve the whole world. The question now was how to rebuild. A new kind of unity was needed to bring together Germany, France and Italy, to create a Europe in which people saw their own prosperity and well-being as bound up with the prosperity and well-being of their European neighbours. This all started because people in uh, the possession of uh, the coal mines and the steelworks of, of the areas around the River Rhine. And why people wanted to possess these is these are what you make guns and armaments with. So if you can stop people feeling that they are rivals over the coal and the steel, you will stop them feeling the need to go to war with each other. What's more, you could create a situation in which people in France think they get better off if German people get better off. And people in Germany think we get better off if people in France get better off. And that led to a common market uh, with uh, common arrangements for heavy industries and for agriculture. Um, to begin with, the northern European countries, including the UK, didn't join in with this uh, common arrangement. But by 1973, the UK, Ireland and Denmark had joined. Later, um, Sweden and Finland and uh, now we have uh, even more countries queuing uh, to join in. But of course it's much more than a common market now. It's a union of practically half a billion people in 15 member states at the moment growing, as we speak even, towards 25. There used to be a war a generation between uh, the countries uh, on the western edge of this continent uh, and then in my lifetime there was an iron curtain down the middle. We've now uh, made uh, war between these countries unthinkable. The old uh, severance of the Iron Curtain is being healed as the countries from Central and Eastern Europe uh, move towards joining and by the next European election many of them will be in the Union. This is a tremendous achievement and we're all part of it. As Europeans we have common laws and a common civil service under the European Commission. European commissioners are nominated by the member nation states, subject to the approval of the European Parliament. Smaller states like Ireland and Denmark nominate one commissioner. Larger ones like the UK can nominate two. The governments of the member states meet regularly in the Council of Ministers. Every member state has one seat on the council and sends one minister to each council session. Which minister a government sends depends on the agenda. The most impressive meetings are those of the European heads of government, when the presidents and prime ministers get together. But all these meetings, the commission, the council and the heads of state, are held in secret, behind closed doors. So what about democracy? How do the people of Europe have their say? People are always worried about uh, power being exercised remotely from, from a far distance uh, and uh, without accountability. Well, the answer to that is to make it accountable. It's uh, very important that uh, people in our communities have a say, uh, and that was the idea behind the setting up of the European Parliament. Uh, here we have a, a directly elected Parliament now, uh, snapping at the heels of the unelected Commission and the closed doors Council of Ministers. 
Today, the ideal of an effective Europe-wide parliament is becoming a reality. Around 375 million people, represented by 626 elected MEPs in 15 countries, are now part of this democracy. The European Parliament is one of three legislative bodies in the European Union and the only one directly elected by the people of Europe. Its consent or advice is always required in European lawmaking. Initial responsibility for drafting new legislation belongs to the European Commission. But once put forward, all legislation goes through a process of being amended and improved or rejected by the Council of Ministers and the Parliament. Membership of the Parliament is loaded in favour of smaller countries to make sure their voices aren't drowned out. There's a rule which says small countries have to have a decent number of representatives to cover political diversity in that country uh, and um, big countries uh, can do with fewer. So for example, the UK has 87 and Denmark has 16. Some people in Scotland think that's not a very good idea from our point of view, because Scotland has the same population as Denmark. There are five million Scots, there are five million Danes, there are eight Scottish members of the European Parliament because we've just got slightly less than a tenth of the whole UK number, but Denmark as an as a, as a independent country within the Union has, has 16. And of course that's something that my political party, the SNP, has things to say about. Until 1992, the Parliament was simply a consultative body. The Treaty of Maastricht in 1992 and the Amsterdam Treaty of 1997 gave it a new power called co-decision. This means that together with the Council of Ministers, it can amend Commission proposals. Only those which have been agreed between all three, Commission, Council and Parliament, finally become law. A co-decision is a very, very important power that's only recently been given to the European Parliament and it means that we can check and balance the uh, unelected and the closed door uh, meetings that go on between the Commission and the Council of Ministers. It means that we can stop uh, or amend uh, proposals and can't be ignored. Unfortunately, co-decision does not apply in all areas of policy and that has very, very important effects, particularly uh, for uh, Scotland because fisheries and agriculture uh, are not co-decision matters. And this is particularly frustrating in my present uh, function because uh, so many uh, areas of our life are regulated in some way by European regulation but Scotland does not have the right to represent uh, our own uh, industries, our own uh, way of life, our own economic uh, interests uh, in the bodies where it really counts uh, in Europe, in the Council of Ministers. The Parliament itself does have real and important lawmaking powers and the Parliament alone has the power to discipline European commissioners or even to dismiss the Commission if necessary. Now it's not just about uh, markets and uh, conditions of uh, fair and free trading, it's also uh, about the, the, the foundation in accepted human rights. We've now got a Charter of Rights of the European Union. Uh, we for a long time had a Convention on Human Rights. This is to say you can only have a successful uh, democratic collaboration among countries which all acknowledge the fundamental rights of human beings and that is a absolute basis of the European Union as it is now. Of course we can only make laws in the European Union for ourselves, uh, but we can exercise an influence on other countries, countries that want to trade with us, uh, and countries indeed which respect uh, aspects of our tradition. And things like the Sakharov Prize awarded by the European Parliament for people who have been prominent in the pursuit and protection of human rights in their own countries actually help people who are maybe suffering oppression uh, to uh, be recognised in their own country and therefore to rise above uh, oppression and, and to re re restore human rights in their own country. There have been a number of striking examples of that. Most of the Parliament's business is conducted in Brussels. Preparing the plenary sessions, the issues and resolutions to be debated is a large part of members' work. They do this through 17 standing committees, which all meet and work here. The article of uh, primary community law is being ignored in a member state. I am challenging the Scottish Minister for Agriculture now to bypass London and to support the SNP's request, which I delivered yesterday to the French government 
that the French authorities study in detail the scientific... Each month, important sittings also take place in Strasbourg, France. At these plenary sessions, members meet, debate and pass resolutions. You might well ask, why does this parliament have two places of work 300 miles apart from each other? And many people, MPs particularly, ask themselves that question. The answer is uh, that uh, the, the treaties that set up the European Union insist that the seat of the parliament is in Strasbourg and it must hold at least 12 sessions a year there. Uh, so we do that, although for other purposes it's much more convenient to work in the other building that we have as the parliament in Brussels. There's a particularly good reason, actually, why Strasbourg was landed on as a headquarters for the parliament. A series of wars across the middle of Europe raged backwards and forwards across the Rhine River. And at the end of one, they would say, right, Alsace is Germany now. And then at the end of the next one, after bloodshed and death and violence, Alsace is in France now. And in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, uh, people began to think, really, enough is enough. We've got to stop this. It, the, the, there must be a way of creating peace in Europe. And Strasbourg is a, a place that's kind of symbolic of that. The Parliament works in 11 languages. It is the only European community institution to hold all its proceedings in public and to publish its findings, opinions and resolutions so that they're available to everyone. One of the things that people sometimes talk about is the bureaucracy, as it's called, of Brussels. And one knows what they mean. But it's worth remembering that there's a great deal of openness in the system of administration so that it's quite straightforward for members of the parliament to get quickly to the level of decision making inside the commission or somewhere in the union which is responsible for issues. Of course, you don't always get them to change their mind, but I think that an MEP has a very good route of access to making sure that complaints that we hear are heard where they should be heard. Within the parliament, members usually sit in one of eight political groups. These groups are built up by members according to their political and ideological links and the position of their own party in their home state. The European Free Alliance, our uh, political family here in the European Parliament, which consists of Scots members, Welsh members, Flemish, and members from various uh, autonomous regions of Spain, exists uh, in order to promote the idea of subsidiarity and of retaining as much authority uh, at as, as local a level as possible uh, so that we do not have a one-size-fits-all uh, European superstate style uh, decision-making process here in Europe. In 1999, the European Free Alliance joined with the Greens. Well, as you can imagine, a lot of people have to show a lot of mutual respect and tolerance and work hard together to get uh, an alliance like that across different countries of different parties and approaches to work. I do think that Ian and I can say fairly that we've done our part along with the others in making a real success of this uh, working group and it is the fourth largest in the European Parliament. There is a growing realisation uh, worldwide that we have to do something, that we have to work together to stop the rot, uh, to save the planet. We have been harvesting, plundering uh, natural resources uh, at a rate which is unsustainable. Uh, and Scotland, uh, as a resource-rich nation, uh, ought to be at the forefront uh, of the kind of sustainable uh, development that we need uh, in order to survive. Uh, and there's lots to do and uh, lots that we can do working with political colleagues internationally uh, in the way that we're doing here in the European Parliament.